Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I know this is short notice and you're very busy finishing up tax returns, but this is such an important topic. And George Blower from MySolo401k.com, I think it's .com, has been gracious enough to help us deal with this issue and teach you how you can use this for your client's benefit and for your own. I'm not going to do much of an intro. All I'm going to tell you is that I finally had a chance to put together a solo 401k from my own firm. Finally, I've been wanting to do it for years. And George and his team has helped me through every single step of the way. I can't tell you how thrilled I am. So George, tell us a little bit about yourself and then it's all yours. Okay, thank you so much. It's so great to be here with everyone and the tax mama. Um, uh, like Eva said, my name is George Blower with the company called My Solo 401k Financial. The website's actually mysolo401k.net. And if you can see it on your screen there, the, the solo401k.com is not us. That's a different company, just to be clear. So sorry about that. Oh, no problem. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's awesome to be here. Uh, this is what we do 24 seven. It's a super powerful tool. Um, I recognize the audience is uh, very busy with the tax season. So we, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen and, and participate. Um, you, know, you can send over questions via the chat feature in the Zoom. And we'll just try to pause once we've got, um, you know, a collection of kind of questions, knock them out and back to the slides. And I think we want to try to get this in with an hour. So I'll try to, uh, you know, keep the pace up. Uh, as far as the agenda, uh, house, just some quick housekeeping. I want to just give us a high level overview of some of the top solo 401k benefits, eligibility, the process. And then I was thinking we would spend the bulk of the time talking about the contribution rules and having kind of a technical conversation, including um, how the, you know, the limits work, how the some of the scenarios we can see those uh, limits in action, et cetera. But and then we can sprinkle in the questions as we go through. So this presentation is being provided for educational purposes only. It should not be construed as tax, legal, or investment advice, nor as a solicitation. When making an investment decision, please consult with your tax attorney and financial professional. So a really quick concept, right? The solo 401k is for think of it as like for an owner only business right you might have say like a doctor who gets paid on a 1099 basis doesn't have any employees working for him or her they can have their own solo 401k because really a 401k is for a business and a solo 401k is for a self-employed individual and so let's just kind of maybe we can keep that in mind as we think about some of these concepts so we'll, and we'll dig in on that a little bit deeper so as far as for us, where we are, the reason that people come to us is there's many, right? But I put here on this slide some of the top kind of use cases or benefits. Number one, contributions. So the solo 401k plan has the highest contribution limits for any defined contribution plan available to self-employed individuals. So for example, for 2022, you could contribute as, or the individual, the solo 401k owner could contribute as much as 61,000 or even 67,500 if they're 50 or older. If they have a plan like ours that allows for it, they could not only make pre-tax contribution to get a tax deduction benefit immediately, but also, or you know, instead or in addition to, or, and or could make Roth or even mega backdoor Roth contributions. So you don't get that tax deduction benefit now, but you got the potential for tax-free growth. Number two, a lot of our clients are also looking to use their retirement money to invest in alternative investments, right? These individuals, you know, they could be a realtor who's self-employed and they know real estate, maybe doesn't really know the stock market. So they want to invest in real estate, right? Or it could be notes or crypto, of course, or private placements. So we don't hold any of our customers' money. We're really neutral as far as where the accounts are at. So we have some folks who are coming to us with an advisor, and maybe that advisor wants to have all the accounts at a specific place, like say Schwab Institutional or TD Ameritrade. 
institutional. Some folks, they just want to have a bank account. So it's it's all acceptable. It's all good from our perspective because, we, because again, we're neutral and we'll help the clients set up the accounts. And so for those that want to invest in these types of alternative investments, they typically find that it's really helpful to have checkbook access to the money. So as the uh, business owner, right? You're the owner of the business that sponsors the trust because that's what a 401k is. It's a retirement trust. The assets are held in trust for the benefit of you know that individual, their future them, right? Future you. But the business owner themselves can be the trustee of the trust. And so you could have a bank account in the name of the trust and then the business owner, the solo 401k owner as the trustee can have that direct checkbook access to the money, which if you're trying to act quickly to invest on an investment opportunity, that can be super helpful. As opposed to those folks who are familiar with the self-directed IRA model, where you have to have the IRA and specialty trust or custodian who holds the money and then you've got time and costs to go through the process to get access to the money to make an investment. Number three, the ability to take a 401k loan. So with our plan, you can take a loan. Like a lot of people are familiar with 401k loans just coming from the corporate world, right? Where you can borrow up to 50% of the balance, not to exceed $50,000. Has to be documented as a loan. We prepare the loan documents as part of our service for no additional charge. The terms of the loan are that it has to be paid back either monthly or quarterly. Equal payments of principal and interest. The interest is going to be prime plus 1% which of course is going up, right? With each Fed meeting, or it could be uh, a CD rate plus 2% with those payments spread out over a five-year term. Okay, eligibility. So we kind of touched on this a little bit just to, just to kind of set the stage here with some of these foundational concepts, but a solo 401k is for an owner-only business with no full-time W-2 employees. What are some of the top eligibility considerations? Do I need a separate entity? No, you don't. You could be a sole proprietor. Of course, if you do have a separate entity, like an LLC or an LLC taxes and S corporation, that's fine. That would be the entity that sponsors the trust, right? That sponsors the plan. Do I need to report earned self-employment income on my taxes? Yes, but there's no minimum amount of earned self-employment income that needs to be reported in order to be eligible. But of course, if you want to make contributions, you can't save more than you earn, right? So you you can't contribute more than your earned self-employment income. So if you don't have very much, you might be eligible, but you won't be able to contribute a relatively high amount. The spouse or business partner may also participate as long as he or she is reporting their own earned self-employment income. The individual can have a solo 401k even if they have a W-2 job, right? A day job, right? They might be working for Microsoft and have their own separate web hosting company, right? So that individual can set up a solo 401k, assuming there's no full-time W-2 employees working for any business owned by that person or spouse, if any, based off of that side self-employment income. So you still got to report the separate self-employment income. So even if you're participating in the Microsoft 401k plan, you could still have a solo 401k based on the web hosting business. A separate EIN is needed uh, for the plan but we don't require that a separate EIN be obtained for the business, right? So that comes up in the context of a sole proprietor. Maybe they have never had an occasion to have an EIN for the business. And so that's not a prerequisite in order to sign up with us. Again, a separate EIN will be obtained for the plan, which meets the IRS expectation. And we obtain that as part of the onboarding process. And then lastly, can I set up a solo 401k if there are non-owner full-time W-2 employees working for another business owned by me or my spouse? The answer is no, because that's going to, and almost always going to be considered a controlled group. So again, the scenario is like, let's say you've got somebody that has a cafe with multiple employees, then they got the side consulting, totally unrelated to the cafe. They'll come and say, well, can I set up the solo 401k for the business, the consulting? That doesn't have any employees. The answer is no, because the two businesses together, right, the cafe with the employees, the consulting with no employees, together are going to constitute a controlled group. So under those controlled group rules, any employee that works for any company within that's part of the control group is going to be considered an employee for purposes of the plan and preclude the ability to set up a solo 401k for the side consulting business. So as far as the process, 
you know, again, it's a legal document. So we got to draft the documents. We draft them within the same day or 24 business hours after the individual signs up. You know, if you're working with a client and you want to be copied, let's take a quick peek at our application in, on, at mysolo401k.net. Under solo401k, click on open account. It's just 10 simple questions, pretty self-explanatory. The last field here asks for the name of the plan. You want to use two words in the word trust. So it could be like X, Y, Z, investment, trust, please. And then just put in there, please copy your name, your email, and then we'll include you on all, on all the communications. So person signs up next business day, they get a link to this portal where they can access the documents to create the plan. They just simply download, sign. We have them go to a page on our website where they tell us where they want to have the account at. Because remember, we're neutral. We got clients at hundreds of different banks, many different brokerages. So they just choose, like, say, Schwab, maybe Mega Backdoor Roth. So that'll trigger us to prepare the paperwork to open up accounts, prepare paperwork to open up accounts at Schwab. So a similar process, we pre-fill the paperwork, another link to the portal, download the paperwork, sign. Like in Schwab's case, the client will upload the paperwork, then we can fax it in to Schwab's back office. You know, that'll probably take four to five business days. So if we're trying to meet the October 17th deadline because a timely extension was filed, you know, let's say the person's a sole proprietor or a C Corp, the business is taxed as a C Corp, there's still time, but the clock is definitely ticking, right? Because these brokerages, even the banks, right? As we get closer and closer to the end of the year, they take they can take longer to process these applications. So once the account is open. Now you can make contributions. Now you can roll over funds from an existing retirement account, like a former employer plan or a Roth IRA, and then start using. So George, again, let's 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 uh, deal with some questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so we got some good questions lined up here. Yes, some of them are mine, but let's start with Nicole. She says, what happens if you have a solo 401k and then get employee a year later? Does that have consequences for the plan? And that kind of ties to once the business grows, can you help us convert it to a regular 401k plan? Um, well, it depends, first of all, whether or not that employee has met the eligibility requirements, meaning that they're W-2 working at least a thousand hours a year with a year of service. Assuming they have. Yeah, so if they don't, then you could still maintain the solo 401k. If they do, then the plan is either gonna have to be wound down before that person becomes eligible, including transferring all the assets out. And now you no longer have a solo 401k or you gotta convert it to a full-time employer plan and no, we don't offer full-time employer plans. You don't offer them, but can you help connect us to somebody who does, who can handle sure. that conversion? Yes. Okay, you have contacts. Okay, will part-time employees disqualify the solo plan? Not if they're not, not if they're not meeting those thresholds. Okay. So if you have a, like if you have someone, let's say you got a high school kid, right? That's under 21. So specifically it's gotta be a W2, 21 years or, or older, and they're working either a thousand hours a year with a year of service or 500 hours a year for three consecutive years. So if it's high school kids working 1500 hours, they're not gonna be eligible, right? Cause they're not 21. But if they're, let's say it's a college kid, but they're working less than a thousand hours, right? They're still not eligible. So you can still keep the solo 401k. Where it's kind of interesting is when uh, you have a child that works in the business. You read right? my mind, yes. So if you have a child that's working in the business, you still have to go through that analysis, right? Because if you a for a solo 401k is a marketing term. What's the technical term? Technical term is a one participant plan. So there are exceptions to that one participant requirement where you'd still be considered a one participant plan. And what's the what's the benefit of being a one participant plan? Well, you're not subject to a lot of the rules that apply to the full-time employer plans under ERISA. So that means it's much more streamlined. You can, you know, you can uh, maintain it. You can set it up for le much less money, right? So Exactly. The, co the costs are, are significantly lower. And also the testing and, and statistical requirements. 
Right. And that's what that's part of the cost, right? It's not something to testing. And why would that be? Because, well, the rules that really apply, because remember, a, people typically think of 401ks, they learn about 401ks from their corporate job, right? Or some job. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the rules that apply are there to protect the non-owner employees, right? Like when we sh shifted from being defined benefit country, right, to defined contribution, a lot of the policymakers were concerned that the, well, the regular employees are going to get lost in the shuffle. So a lot of those rules are there to protect them. But if it's just an owner only business, right, there's not, there, there's, there isn't that same policy concern. And so, but, so under the rules, you can have a spouse, you can have a business partner, as long as they're a 3% or more business partner, and it'd still be considered a one participant plan. So then the question becomes up, well, my kid wants to work in the business, right? And let's say they got out of college, right? So they're over 21. They're going to be full time. Can I still maintain the solo 401k? Well, no, unless you make that child at least a 3% or more owner, because then they can fall into the partner exception and it's still considered to be a one participant plan. Hang on, hang on, hang on. California you are considered to own anything that any related party owns. So a child, by, I'm in, because California is a community property state, by IRS rules, owns their parents' stock. So in community mm -hmm. property states, does that, does that apply? Do you still have to make them at least a 3% or more owner? Even if you don't, because of the imputed ownership. Well, you would just be opening yourself up to um, that would be your only basis to say that you're still eligible to keep the solo 401k. Right. So instead, uh, make the kid an owner. So we've got a couple more questions and I don't really want to interrupt you, but I, I want to go through these last couple of things. Um, one of them is also from me. Just kind of a reminder, if they have leased employees, if they have leased employees, they take their full-time employees and lease them. That isn't going to disqualify the plan because the rules for leased employees require them to provide uh, coverage through the leasing company. Yes. I mean, so you're saying that in this scenario, the business has leased employees, but they're getting a plan through the, the leasing company. They're right. required under the IRS rules, they're required to be covered and the employer is required to com contribute a specific amount to the least employees coverage. So that may be one way around having employees and still keeping the 401k plan. Yes, I agree. I mean, it's, I would say that for a least employee scenario, it would be good to look at it specifically, but but I agree with the concept of what you're saying is that the, it may not be fatal. No. And so we have a couple more questions. Can you open a solo 401k with an ITIN number? Well, so you, again, if we don't require that a business EIN is required to open a plan with us, as opposed to like, for example, if you go to a basic plan provider, like a Fidelity, right? Or a Schwab who doesn't offer loans or Roth or support, you know, those companies require that the business EIN be first obtained. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, but we do as part of our process require that a separate EIN be obtained for the plan. So I know, but, but the owner, can the owner have an ITIN or must they have a social security number? Yeah, I understand. So the, uh, so then the process becomes, okay, well, applying for that EIN. So it, it, my understanding is if you have an I-10, you cannot go through the online process. So you'd have to go through the, the paper process that's submitted okay. to the IRS. So yes, it can be done, but it's probably going to take longer. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes six weeks. You know, Right. Okay. But they can, they just have to plan far ahead. Exactly. Yep. Okay, and then one more question from Don. He says, George says we can use most brokerage accounts. If we already have an IRA or Roth, can we use that account to do this solo 401k or do we need to start over with a broker? Yeah, you definitely could not use an IRA or Roth IRA to make the contributions. It has to go into a separate dedicated account specifically for the 401k. 
but you can use the same brokerage and open all the new accounts and George and his team will help you do that. Assuming it's one of the brokerages, which there are several, but it wouldn't be, for example, Vanguard. I don't know where the IRA or Roth IRA is at, but Vanguard it doesn't accommodate third-party What you're claim. doing. Yeah, yeah. Jor, uh, Don, Don in the hidden, in the direct message, mentioned Schwab. And I know we can do that because you just did that for me. Yep. So Schwab is definitely not a problem. You've had thousands of people at Schwab. Great. So, Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, awesome. I love the, the interaction. So and is so I'll let you decide which questions we ask. Okay. Your We've got them we all. Ask. Okay, awesome. So and we'll try to pick up the pace here. So I mean, this is a good slide. It just shows you the different considerations in terms of the different sub accounts that are needed. So you have you have to have different accounts if you've got different participants in the plan, different types of money like pre-tax, Roth, a mega backdoor Roth, or there could be bank or brokerage or even both. This is a slide just showing what you can roll over to the plan. You can't roll over Roth IRA money because the Roth IRA rules don't allow you to roll over Roth IRA money to any type of 401k. We handle the transfer process as part of our services. So now let's get to contributions. So can I still make 2021 solo 401k contributions? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. It depends on how the business is taxed. So what I mean by what we're talking about, if there are different types of contributions that can be made to a solo 401k, right? Because in the words of the IRS, you have different hats, right? You're the employee, you're the employer, you could be making uh, after tax, you could be making pre-tax, et cetera. So if you look at IRS Publication 560, which is the landmark guidance for self-employed retirement plans like solo 401ks, there's a chart on page three, which makes crystal clear that if the plan was established by the end of the tax year, so for 2021, assuming we're in a calendar year, December 31st, That'll preserve the right to make all types of contributions anytime up until the business tax return deadline, including any timely filed extension. And oftentimes the question becomes, well, I thought I had to make employee by the end of the year. Well, that's the rule that applies to full-time employer plans, like a day job 401k plan. But for self-employed individuals, you got more time. And that makes sense logically because a lot of self-employed individuals don't know how much they've made until the dust is settled, right? Until the end, until after the end of the year. So, so for those folks who signed up with us by December 31st, they have until your their business tax return deadline, including any timely filed extension to make all types of 2021 contributions. So, you know, we're in the midst of the contribution season now for folks who signed up at the end of last year, and now they're making their contributions. But then the question becomes, well, what if I set up the plan after December 31st. Well, under the SECURE Act, you know, that deadline was pushed out. Unfortunately, the IRS had some conflicting guidance, which has caused the, uh, the ability to make uh, employee contributions to be uh, limited. And I'm sorry here for the change, but the, uh, but you can still make employer and after tax. So let's be, let, let me restate that to be clear. We have a typo here. So that should say employer, sorry about that. So if you set up the plan now, right? And you filed a timely extension, let's say you're on a, a sole proprietor. So you are obviously on a calendar year, your business tax return deadline is really your 1040 deadline. Let's say you filed an extension. So now you got to all October 17th right to file your 1040, you could still set up a plan for 2021 and make employer and or voluntary after-tax contributions, but it's too late to make employee. You would have had to set, you would have had to have set up the plan by the end of the last year to still be able to make employee contributions. So we'll talk about more about what these contribution limits are as we go through the, the next few slides. So what I was going to uh, do now is really go through some of the details of how the contribution rules work, talk about some scenarios, et cetera. So that's a common question that we feel. So anytime we talk about how much can I contribute, it's important to take a step back and recognize that it's, well, it depends, depends right? Because it's based on 
the following factors, your income, your, because you can't save more than you earn, your age, right? Because you, once you go, once you're 50 or older, you can make a catch-up contribution, whether you participate in another retirement plan, like a day job plan, and the type of contribution that you're looking to make. <clears throat> now, it is based on how the business is taxed. So for these set of slides, we're focusing on S Corp and C Corp. So if the business is taxed as an S Corp or a C Corp, the ability to make contributions is based on the W-2 wages that are received from the self-employed business. So not the wages received from the day job. You also can't consider the K-1 that you might get from the S Corp. So the first step is, okay, determine that earned self-employment income. So you would use box one of the W-2 plus any pre-tax elective deferrals, not in box one and moved over to uh, box 12. So that would be, for example, like for 2021, the 19,500. Next, you've got to consider the overall contribution limits. So for 2021, the overall limit is 58,000, another 6,500 if you're 50 or older. It went up for 2022, 61,000. The catch up stayed the same. You know, all the, all, we all anticipate that it's going to keep going up, you know, given inflation. Then you've got to consider the contribution type, right? Are we talking about employee? Are we talking about employer? Are we trying to do Roth or after tax? So let's look at each limit, you know, each based on each type. So employee contributions also referred to as salary deferrals. So it's going to, that limit is 100% of the self-employment compensation. So for a business that's taxed as an S or a C, that's again the W-2 wages from that business, not to exceed $19,500 for 2021 or an additional $6,500 if you're 50 or older. For 2022, that's going up to $20,500 or $27,000 if you're 50 or older. Now you do need to reduce the employee contributions by any other employee contributions made to another plan, like the 401k day job plan. Like think of that tech person that works at Microsoft, right? So if they max out their contributions made to their 401k through Microsoft, they're not going to be able to make any more employee contributions to the solo 401k because the employee contribution limit applies at the employee level. Now, the one exception is if the other plan is a 457 governmental plan. In that case, the contributions are not aggregated. Those employee contributions, if you have a plan that allows for it, like ours does, can be made as a Roth contribution. So you could do 100% or some mixture, right? It could be some pre-tax, some Roth, again, up to $19,500 for 2021 or $20,500 for 2022, plus an additional $6,500 if you're 50 or older can be made as either pre-tax or Roth employee. Now you got switching hats, employer. So for a business that's taxed <clears throat> as an S Corp or a C Corp, the employer contribution limit, also known as profit sharing, is 25% of the W-2 wages. So again, remember we wanna use box one of the W-2 plus any pre-tax elective deferrals, not in box one. So a simple example, let's say you have somebody that has effectively $100,000 of W-2 wages, right? And they make a pre-tax employee contribution of $19,500. So their box, one of their W-2 is going to be $80,500 because you're going to take out nineteen five, dollars put it over in box 12. So then the question becomes, well, how much can I contribute as an employer? I know it's 25% of my W-2 wages. Is it 25% of 80,500 or is it 20, 25% of 100,000? Well, we know it's 25% of 100,000 because you take box one, 80,500 plus the 19,500 that's over in box 12. So you can contribute 25,000 or 25% of those W-2 wages. Keeping in mind, of course, that the total contributions made to the plan can't exceed that overall limit. 58,000 for 2021, 61,000 for 2022. 
Now contrast this employer contribution rule that with the employee rule in terms of aggregation when it comes to contributions made to another plan. So the employer limit applies at the employer level. So even though that person that's working at Microsoft might be getting a matching contribution or maybe a profit sharing contribution made by their employer, that doesn't reduce how much can be made to the solo 401k. So even though they might max out the employee contributions to their 401k at Microsoft, they can't make any more employee, they could still make the employer contribution based off of the self-employment compensation from their, from their side business. Now, the one exception to that is if contributions are made by that person or on their behalf to a 403b. Under that 403b rule, you really have to treat all the 403b contributions, whether made by or on behalf of the individual, as if they're made to the solo 401k for purposes of determining whether you've hit that limit. Now, uh, lastly- Let me, let me, oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay, all right, I'll just finish with the limits here. So the last mm -hmm. one is the, the after tax, which is how folks make the mega backdoor Roth. So here, the individual can contribute 100% of their self-employment compensation, right? Which again, the W-2 wages, all the way up to the overall limit. So dollar for dollar as a voluntary after-tax contribution. So for some folks that want to maximize the mega backdoor Roth, they might say, well, I don't want to make any employee. I don't want to make any employer. I want to make it all as an after-tax. So they can do dollar for dollar all the way up to the overall limit, 58 or 61. Now, keep in mind, that that overall limit doesn't go up if you're 50 or older, but you do get to ignore the catch-up contributions that were made to the solo. And of course, you have to reduce it by any other employee or employer contributions that you make to the solo. So some folks say, well, first I want to maximize my pre-tax tax deduction benefit and whatever's left, let me put it in as a mega backdoor Roth. So if I've got 100,000 W-2 wages, let's say I'm under 50, I might put in 19.5 as an employee, get the tax deduction benefit, Put another twenty-five thousand as an employer, so that takes us up to, if my math is right, forty-four thousand five hundred, and then go all the way up to fifty-eight thousand, right, as an after-tax, and then move it into the Roth. So, just like the employer, the voluntary after-tax limit is not impacted by contributions made to another retirement plan through an unrelated employer. So, like the day job plan, unless the other plans are four hundred three B, and then. Lastly, the last point there is that those after-tax contributions have to go into a separate sub-account. So that's how why you end up with some folks having, you know, three accounts, pre-tax, Roth, and then after-tax at the bank or the brokerage, wherever they want to have it. So thank you so much for letting me finish that. So I'll let you jump in with the questions. <laughs> well, one of them was, was something you were actually answering is um, if they are covered by another 401k plan at work. Are they mm -hmm. their contributions limited overall to you know all plans? Are they limited to these numbers, all plans combined, or can they have like fifty eight thousand in each, the one at work and the one here? Yeah, it depends on. Um, I mean, let's say that they have fifty eight thousand in their day job plan, right? Mm -hmm. across, across between the employee plus their employer, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So they're not going to be able to make any more employee contributions because I'm assuming that they put the max in, the max employee, right? But they could still make employer. And if they have the self-employment compensation to justify it, they could do a whole another 58 to the employer, to their solo 401k. So they can still pick up the 25% of earned income with that employer wages or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the employer could could contribute that. Guys, this is monumental. I didn't even realize that. So thank you for pointing it out. The other question about that that I have is, um, will you help us make these con these computations, especially as we're learning? All the, all the time. Yeah, we feel these questions all the time, every okay. day. Then Susan is asking, I am a sole proprietor with a solo 401k. My husband in a community property state has a business with 20 employees. Business has a simple plan. Is my solo 401k plan okay? So it's going to always depend on the facts and circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, if you look at the the aggregation rules, so let me pull them up real quick because I think it'll be helpful. One second. Please. And of course, you want to discuss this with your tax advisor, right? But these are these are the tax advisors, the people who are here. Got it. Okay. So, so if you Google IRS control group rules, you pull up this guide here, and I think we go down to I want to say page eleven. Uh, no, page twelve. Um, so you got the family attribution rules, right? That's the one. Yeah, so the ownership of the spouse is attributed to the other spouse. So option one is file for divorce. Oh. Just kidding, just kidding. Hey, hey uh, have, you been, have you been reading my articles? That's what <laughs> I've been recommending. <laughs> but so that's the default. So the ownership of the spouse is going to be attributed to the other spouse. Now, the exception, so if the spouse that has a business with no employees the other spouse, we're assuming, has 100% of a business with employees, right? Right. So, so there is no attribution between spouses if there is no direct ownership, no participation in the company, meaning the spouse that doesn't have any employees, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not more than 50% of the of the business is of business gross income is passive investments. So we're assuming the last one is satisfied, right? Okay. So even let's assume though there's, let's assume there's no participation. Mm -hmm. Right. So that but that brings us to direct ownership. Right. Indirect so think, ownership. Pardon. Indirect ownership in California, in community property states. Well, that, that begs the question, well, how does that work in the context of uh, community property state? And the, and the risk here, right, is that the state would decide who owns what. Right. And so they would, and so that would be pre-decided by the state that the spouse that has a business with no employees under those community property rules owns the other part of the other business with employees. So we can't get into this exception box, which means you can't have a sole before we get. Now, I have heard folks that are exploring things that such as, um, trying to, uh, I'm trying to think of the right technical word, but like it's almost like you're disavowing that ownership. Yeah, I was thinking that contractually you you set it up the way you would a postnuptial and say this is his and, all, and his only, sign, sign the title and so forth and ownership and to disclaim each of the- Disclaim. The, yeah. each of the the ownership in the relative business so that might be a way to do it without divorcing exactly so it's almost which i'm sure that this comes up not necessarily in solo 401k context but just the notion of like how do you overcome these community property rules is there a way to contractually overcome it with a good attorney got it yeah. So if you can contractually overcome it, um, then I think you'd be in a much better place. But there are, other, other, there are other implications, folks, before you do this. <laughs> exactly. So it may not be worth it, right? I don't to just to have a solo form. OK, I mean, they're great, but I don't know if you want to give up your community property rights, you know. Oh, but she brings up an issue. If you already have a simple plan. And you leave it dormant. Can you now set up a, 40, a solo 401k? Right. Can you have, in other words, can you have a simple IRA and mm -hmm. solo 401k? Right. Yep. Let's see if I think I have a resource here. One second. You tell me, I'll find it. Okay. Incidentally, you can also post URLs into the chat file.
tell you what, why don't we get to that later and go ahead, continue with your presentation and uh, what was the subject we were looking for? And I will uh, make a note. Sure, sorry about that. I have That's to, okay. We asked have, the question. There is a way to do it and I'm trying to find the good resource on that. Okay, so resource to disclaim, we'll come back to that. Okay. And, and just remember everybody, if you have questions that weren't answered, if you place them into the Tax Mama website, if you're not a member of the class or into the board, um, we will answer the questions for you later. We will give them to George and he'll respond um, in the next few days. So this is a place to post them if you are not a student. If you are, post them into the board. So the, the, the idea is that, okay, and I think I found the notice. The, 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 it is possible as long as you didn't make a contribution for the same year. It is possible to have a simple IRA and a solo 401k as long as you don't make a contribution for the same year. Okay. Sorry for that late answer here. That's okay. Yeah. Simples aren't that simple. <laughs> right? That's a good one. So, okay, and we've got, looks like 18 minutes left. So we can spend some time going through contribution scenarios. So what I did here is I started out with baseline assumptions and then we can tweak the, the assumptions. To, and I think that illustrates some of the points. So let's assume that we got a self-employed business taxes and S corporation. It's one participant who's under 50 years of age, doesn't make contributions to another plan. Their goal is to maximize pre-tax contributions, right? Get the tax deduction benefit and then make Roth or voluntary after-tax contributions if they can, if they still have, you know, capacity to, if they're still limited, et cetera. Let's assume they got a hundred thousand of W-2 wages. So- Okay, don't worry about the time. Okay, thank you so much. So in that baseline scenario, right? This person, remember they first want to fill up the pre-tax bucket. They could do 19,500 for 2021 because they could do 100% of their W-2 wages or 20,500 for 2022. They could then go on and make a 25% or 25,000 of W-2 wages uh, employer pre-tax contribution. So now for 2022, 2021, they have $44,500 in their pre-tax bucket and they can do the difference up to the overall limit as an after-tax contribution. Right, so that's another thirteen five for twenty twenty one, or fifteen thousand five hundred dollars for twenty twenty two. Now let's change the assumption to illustrate how it works. So let's instead of saying a hundred thousand of W two wages, let's say they have fifty thousand W two wages. So this person could still make the nineteen five or the twenty thousand five hundred, one hundred percent of W two wages as an employee pre-tax. Now their employer employer limit though goes down because it's a percentage, right? 25% of 50 now is 12,500. And then they can do the difference <clears throat> up to 50, right? Because remember, you can't save more than you earn, right? So in this situation, the total contributions can't exceed 50,000. So they could do the difference up to is 18 for 2021 or 17 for 2022 as a voluntary after-tax contribution. So now let's go back to the baseline scenario. So they're back to having 100,000 of W-2, but now let's assume that this person has that day job and maximizes the contributions to the day job. So they contribute 19,500 for 2021 or 20,500 for 2022 to their day job plan. So you can see that they cannot make any employee contributions to the solo 401k because that employee limit applies at the employee level. They can still make the employer contributions because the employer limit applies at the employer level. So that, that would be just like in the original scenario. They can do 25% of 100,000 or 25,000 as a pre-tax. And then they could do the difference you know, up to the overall limit. So that'd be another... 33 for 2021 or 36 for 2022 as an after-tax contribution. And then move it over to the Roth 
401k account. So now let's go back to the base. This person doesn't make contributions to another plan. They still have 100,000 of W-2 wages. But let's assume that their goal is to maximize the Roth and or the voluntary after-tax, the mega backdoor Roth. So here they could do a, the, you know, the full employee contribution, 19.5 or 20,500. But instead of making that as a pre-tax contribution, this person's not interested in pre-tax, so they make it as a Roth. Let's assume that they don't make any employer because employer contributions are always pre-tax contributions. So then they just do the difference up to the overall limit, be another 38,500 or 40,500 for 2022 as an after-tax. So they put 19,500 into their Roth for 2021 in their Roth solo 401k sub account put another 38,500 in the after-tax account and then move it, move the money from the after-tax to the Roth. So at the end of the day, they have 58,000 in their Roth solo 401k sub account. Okay, do me a huge favor because this is making Lulu and me crazy and we have to rethink it every single time. Please clarifying, define um, pre-tax and after-tax. Sure. So pre-tax means that you reduce your taxable income now. So if your business is taxed as an S corporation, right, you're going to take, <clears throat> let's say you make that $19,500 pre-tax employee contribution. That's going to reduce what's in box one of your W-2. So instead of having $100,000 carried over to your 1040, Right, it's only going to be 80,500. And that 19,5 is going to be put over in box 12 of your W 2. So you reduce your taxable income now. But then, of course, when you have gains inside that 401k account, because now you're investing it in whatever you're investing it in. And then you later, when you retire, take the money out of the 401k. Well, you deferred that income and now it's grown the pot of money has grown. So now you have to pay income tax on that money when you later take it out when you retire. As opposed to after tax or Roth, right? So when you put Roth money in or after tax money in, it doesn't reduce your uh, income now. So like if you are this person over here that doesn't make any pre-tax contributions, right? This person is making a $19,500 employee contribution and making it as a Roth contribution. So their box one is still going to be $100,000. Now they have to report that Roth contribution on the W-2, but it doesn't reduce box one. So you still are carrying over the four hundred. dollars You're still paying the taxes on that now. But now when you have gains inside that Roth 401k account, when you take the money out when you retire, assuming that you take it out as a qualified Roth distribution, meaning it's been in there for at least five years, you're at least 59 and a half years of age, then you could take all those gains out totally tax-free. Does that Okay, yes. Help? Okay, so the voluntary after-tax is a contribution that they are making subsequently. It does not reduce box one, but it does reduce their net cash flow basically from the wages. Yes, it does, right? Because that money's got to go somewhere. It's going into right. that after-tax account. And right. so let's let's jump ahead to kind of illustrate it too. So okay. I think we've got some slides, some visuals here. I think we do. Uh, I, guess, I guess we have just a couple little ones at least. So basically, though, the employer's part, the employer's yeah, contribution that, is the one that's not taxed and that we roll over into a backdoor 401k. Yeah, so like you see how this little illustration here, we got the three different mm -hmm. sub accounts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this could be at Schwab, right? Mm -hmm. Where you literally have three different brokerage accounts. And so 
if you're making a pre-tax contribution, whether it's the employee or the employer, that money is going into this pre-tax account. If you're making the after-tax contribution, it's going into this after-tax account. And if you're making a Roth contribution, it's going into the Roth account. So like in this scenario, in this slide, the person is putting in 19.5 as a pre-tax, 25,000 as a pre-tax employer. So that money is in this account, right? Then the person <clears throat> is not able to make any more. Did, I mean, they didn't make any of the employee contributions, the 19.5 as a Roth contribution. So no contribution was directly made to the Roth. Instead, they made the 13.5 to this after-tax account, and then they move it from the after-tax account over to the Roth account. So that is effectively what a mega backdoor Roth is. So you, have to, put you. It in, you have to put it into the separate voluntary after-tax account, and then you move it to the Roth. So that move from the after-tax account to the Roth is a reportable event. So we have forms on our website where clients tell us about the money that they moved over so we can capture the information so we can prepare a 1099R. Right. Now, now you could move money from the pre-tax account over to the Roth. That would be an in-plan Roth conversion. So <clears throat> let's say that somebody is still eligible to set up. Let, let's say that the person had set up the plan you know, by December 31st of 2021. So they could still make all types of contributions because we know if they were to set it up now before the deadline, they could only make the employer the after tax, not the employee, right? So, but let's just for illustration purposes, you know, let's say that they made those 2021 contributions, they made it as pre-tax contributions so they reduced their 2021 taxable income. And then let's say that they move money from the pre-tax account to the Roth account, the same money that they contributed. Well, effectively, what have they done? They've taken income that they owed income tax on for 2021, and they've just moved it to 2022, right? They sort of kicked the can down the road. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're opening the account now, and they can make 2022 contributions even though they're still working on making 2021 contributions. Yes. Yeah. They can definitely still make 2022 contributions. You just even if you're making 2021 contributions now, of just course, you want to be confident that you got the 2022 income to justify the contributions so you don't end up in an excess contribution scenario. And you have to be very, very sure to designate the year for the contribution. Yes, of course, that would be the best from a record keeping perspective. Interesting. Okay. Hang on. Sandra says, so I understand for tax return purposes, if you want to defer your tax because you will you believe you will have less income when you retire, you might consider all pre-tax options possible. Yes, all Roth and after tax contributions and not defer any tax currently. Yeah, so the only thing then that would be taxable later are the employer contributions. Well, anything that's in a pre-tax account, which could be pre-tax employee, it could be pre-tax employer, it could be pre-tax money that you rolled over from a former employer plan. Okay, thank you. But you don't, but you don't have to make, as we see in these scenarios, you don't have to make the employer. You can skip ahead and just make after tax only. So, okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Okay. Great. So let's see. We talked about this, I believe. So now we're at this scenario where the person, you know, again, we're under 50. We don't make contributions to another plan. We got a hundred thousand to W2. We're not interested in pre-tax. <clears throat> so we put the entire employee contribution into the Roth bucket. We don't make an employer contribution because we don't, we're not interested in pre-tax contributions. We make the rest as an after-tax. <clears throat> so let's talk about a scenario where we have two people, right? Let's assume each person, just for ease of illustration, 
is the same, right? They're both under 50. People don't make contributions to another plan. They, each person makes $100,000 of W-2 wages, and they want to first maximize pre-tax before they start making Roth and or after-tax contributions. So really, the point, I mean, the, the, it's going to work the, exactly the same. The, the, the point here is to understand is that each person's ability to contribute is based off of their own situation, right? So if you want to have a spouse participate in the plan, that's fine as long as the spouse is working in the business and reporting his or her, her own self-employment income. But the spouse's ability to contribute is going to be based off of the spouse's self-employment income. So some people might say, well, you know, I have this, I have a, do, a day job, I have this side business, you know, most of the income is reported under my name. So I'm already maximizing to my day job. Now let's bring on my spouse. But if the spouse is not really reporting very much self-employment income, they're not going to be able to contribute very much, but maybe there might be flexibility in, <clears throat> you know, determining how much of that self-employment income is reported under the spouse's tax return versus the other spouse's tax return. So hopefully that point comes through. So let's go back to the base now. So, and let's change the factor that the person's now 50 or older. <clears throat> So in that situation, again, $100,000 W-2 wages, they want to maximize pre-tax. So now they get to still put in the 19.5 for 2021 or the 20,000 for 2022, but they get to do another $6,500 catch up. They can still do the employer 25,000 or 25% of that, those $100,000 of W-2 wages. And then they can still make the after tax. So what this is, what this scenario helps to illustrate is that the after tax limit doesn't go up, but you also ignore the catch-up contribution, so you still end up in the same place as the original scenario. So it's 58,000 for 2021, less 195, the solo 401k employee contribution made, less 25,000, ignore the catch-up, so you still got $13,500 of room there to make an after-tax contribution. So let's go back to the base. Here, this person ma makes contributions, the max to a day job plan, but their goal is to maximize Roth and or voluntary after tax. So here they can't make any employee contributions because again, we're assuming that, <clears throat> that they already hit the max under their day job plan, the 19.5 for 2021, and that employee limit applies at the employee level we're assuming they don't want to make employer pre-tax contributions because em employer contributions are pre-tax, right? And they're only focused on making Roth or mega backdoor Roth. So now they make the entire contribution as an after-tax contribution, which again is 100% of the self-employment compensation, the W-2 wages, dollar for dollar up to the overall limit, 58,000 for 2021, 61,000 for 2022. You don't have to reduce it by contributions made to the day job plan, the day job 401k plan. So they could still, you know, back to one of the earlier points, right? They could still do 58,000 to the solo and still be making additional contributions to their day job plan. Okay, so a similar scenario, except now let's assume the person's 50 or older. So again, they still can't contribute any employee contributions to the solo 401k because they already hit the max to the day job. They don't want to make employer contributions because their goal is Roth or mega backdoor Roth. So they can still get to the 58. So again, this point illustrates that point, right? That you could still make the full 58,000 to the solo as an after tax. It also illustrates the point that that limit doesn't go up because you're 50 or older. So hang on, along those lines, um, Somebody who just asked, Aaron just asked, how do the contributions change for the individual if there isn't an S corp or C corp election, if they're just a Schedule C filer? How can how much can they contribute? Okay, so now we want to focus on someone who's a who's got a Schedule C, and let's say they have a hundred thousand dollars. Got it. 
So, yeah, awesome question. So, yeah, like, a, like we talked about at the beginning, you know, how much you can contribute depends on different factors. And one of those very important factors is how the self-employed business is taxed. So for someone who's, who reports their self-employment income on Schedule C, because let's say they're a sole proprietor, or let's say they have a single member LLC, this is a disregarded entity, right? Your ability to contribute to the plan <clears throat> is based on self-employment compensation. So what that means is for that individual is you take line 31 of Schedule C, so that's your net income, right, after your business expenses, et cetera, less one half of the self-employment tax. So you have to do a pre-calculation. And that is your self-employment compensation figure. So you can contribute 100% of that amount up to 19.5 as an employee or <clears throat> for 2021, you could do another 6,500. Again, 100% dollar for dollar if you're 50 or older. Uh, you could make the voluntary after-tax contribution 100% dollar for dollar of that amount all the way up to the overall limit, just reduced by any other contributions you make to the plan. Now, the employer contribution limit is, it's a percentage, but it's 20% of that number. So instead of 25%, like the W-2 wages when your business is taxed as an S or a C, the employer limit is 25, 20%, two zero of that self-employment compensation figure. So after you run that pre-calculation, it would be 20% as an employer contribution that can be made. And then if your business, just to finish the, the set here, right? if your business is taxed as a partnership, <clears throat> you take line 14 of the K-1 less one half of the self-employment tax, that's your self-employment compensation. And just like with the sole proprietor, the single member LLC, it's going to the employer contribution limit is 20% of that number. Now we do have some resources on our website where we've got all these slides posted. <clears throat> Let's go to the mysolo401k.net. And then hang on, I've, I've got a question because now I'm confused about what you just said. Um, okay. you said that on a schedule C, they can they can contribute up to the full amount of their income minus the half of the self-employment taxes, but then you said it's limited to 20% of the profits, less the self-employment tax. Yes. So which one? Which one? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. So the Schedule um, C. Yes. Yeah, so we first when your business is taxed as a sole proprietor, you have to run a pre-calculation to figure out what your self-employment compensation is. So your self-employment compensation <clears throat> is line 31 of Schedule C less one half of the self-employment tax. Got that. But can we and contribute so, only 20% of that? Or you said something about 100%. That's, that's so it, the confusion. Right. So the employee, the employer limit, right, go. is is twenty percent of your self-employment compensation. The employer limit, as opposed to the employer limit for somebody whose business is taxed as an S or a C, it's twenty-five percent of the W two wages. If you're a sole proprietor, it's twenty percent of the self-employment compensation. Hang on then. Okay. So that's the employer limit to basically match what the owner is putting in as, as technically an employee. Well, it's, I wouldn't use the word match, just not to be too nitpicky. But supplement, it's not, to supplement. It's, it's not a matching contribution. Right. But that's the employer limit. Remember we said that solo 401ks, you're the employee, the employer, mm -hmm. you can make both types. So this, so the Schedule C business owner can make both an employee and em, and an employer contribution. Okay, right. So the difference is that you, the employer limit for that sole proprietor is going to be twenty percent of their self employment compensation. Yeah, I was always familiar with that. I didn't understand how the 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 employee part of that worked. Okay. So the employee, though, is just like the 
just like the S Corp owner that has a W-2 wages, they can contribute 100% of their W-2 wages at the 19.5 as an employee. The sole proprietor can do 100% of their self-employment compensation dollar for dollar up to 19.5. There's no percentage for that type of contribution. Okay. Now I understand. That, okay, awesome. Yeah, that's a really great question. Okay. So let's go back to the uh, scenarios. So it, this, I think we talked about this one with the two. So that takes us to the, we were gonna highlight a resource with our calculator. So let's see here. If you go to mysolo401k.net under learn, then click on online tools. And from here, you can access our calculator. So that could be a helpful resource and you can uh, print it, you can expand, look at the detail. It shows the different, it compares versus other types of uh, retirement plans out there. So you can see how the 401k, the solo 401k is more powerful. Okay, once you know how much you're gonna contribute, now it's time to make the contribution. It could be made by check, by wire, it can come from a 401k perspective, it's acceptable <clears throat> to come from either the personal account or the business account. Now, based on feedback from some clients, say accountants, they would rather see the employer contribution come from the business account, whereas the employee contribution come from the personal account. But what, we can't sit here and say that it has to from a 401k perspective. So this is in some of the details, you know, in terms of the contributions, like we talked about, it could be electronic, it could be check. You know, you want to have, again, the different sub accounts. If you got different participants, different types of money, like pre-tax and Roth. Um, Aaron has a good question. Since we are the tax preparers here, is the employer portion up to the 20% deductible as a business expense on Schedule C? It is not, correct? It's still a, a deducted. Both the employer and the employee contributions are deducted as adjustments on Schedule 1, correct? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're talking about, a, again, the sole uh, proprietor scenario? Yes. Yes, exactly. Because if you had, if it was coming off of Schedule C, it would be a circular issue. Right, because you're taking Schedule C to figure out how much you can contribute, and then you're taking it off Schedule C, to, you know, so it would be it would never end. Yeah, so, so you don't so you don't get to deduct it on Schedule C and reduce self-employment no. taxes. No, so let's go back to that guides page where we can access all these different uh, resources. So, Aaron, that's one of the reasons that it's 20% on Schedule C instead of 25% because that circular computation. Exactly. You basically get to the same place. There's not like a special advantage of being an S or a, uh, or a sole proprietor from a solo 401k contribution perspective. So let's see here. This is the one of the sole props. Yes, yeah, so we talk about, yeah, exactly. It's on schedule one of the 1040, whether it's the employee pre-tax or the employer. Roth, you don't, it doesn't get reported on the 1040 because it's after tax. Same with uh, voluntary after tax. Yeah, just remember, the, there are a lot of really useful tools on his website, and there's a community that you can log into and get direct answers to a great deal of information. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we'll talk about that in the end here, but just to, uh, I mean, I appreciate you bringing that up. We, let's see here. Yeah, that's yeah. from the IRS website. That's That's very, very useful. Yep. So it, gives you, it gives you an overview. So my solo 401k.net forward slash community. We have a Zoom call every day at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. You can also uh, go to the forums and people pass, 
post questions there so you can see what other folks are asking. So those are your um, main tools. But yes, here, this is a snippet of that uh, page three of IRS publication 560. So you can see when to set up the plan by the end of the tax year. So that reserves the right to make the elective deferral, also known as an employee, as well as the employer by the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. That was one of the good changes from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think that's where it came from. Let's see. So then this chart here just is a good, just to keep track of those deadlines. And then for 2022, so for folks that are setting up, you know, there's still plenty of time to set up the plan for 2022. You just have to sign the documents. We generate the documents within one business day. You don't have to open the account. You don't have to make the contributions <clears throat> until the deadline in 2023. So you can, so if you that'll if you sign the documents, you'll lock in the ability to make those contributions. And then here, this this these slides here were focused on the S corp C corp scenario. So how do I report? So employee contributions, they're over in box twelve. If they're pre tax, they're in box twelve but with a different code. If they're Roth. The after-tax contributions, it's optional per those W-2 instructions, whether to report those on the W-2. The employer contributions get reported on the business tax return, whether it's an S corporation return or the 1120 if you're a C corp. Matching contributions don't apply. So matching contributions only apply to a full-time employer plan. The you know, of course, a matching contribution is when the employee makes a contribution and the employer then matches that contribution. So when you have a solo 401k, you can make employer contributions, also known as profit sharing contributions, but there's no prerequisite to make the employee, right? Like you talked about the scenario where somebody already hit their employee limit under their day job plan, they're still going to be able to make the employer notwithstanding that they didn't make any employee to the solo 401k. What is not a contribution? So sometimes this will come up in terms of, you know, whether this is counted towards my limit, things like that. So a, a money that you roll into the plan from an existing retirement account, like a former employer plan or a non-Roth IRA, earnings in this, based on your investment, you know, like we talked about at the outset, a lot of people use our plan because they want to invest in real estate. So those earnings that are coming back based on your solo 401k investment, that's not going to count as a, as a contribution. Amounts converted, right? If you have money that's in that pre-tax account and you want to move it over to the Roth, when it comes into that Roth account, that's not considered to be a contribution that's going to count towards these limits repayment of solo 401k loans. These are all funds that are coming into your 401k account, but it's not considered to be a contribution and therefore not subject to those contribution limits that we've been going through. Okay, that brings us to the end of the slides, the substantive slides. Do we wanna go through some more questions? Yeah, um, hang on one second. Um... Because you can borrow from, from the account and uh, in one of our classes, I used a pretty good outline of, hang on, of how you can fund the account using the loan and the tax break, the tax savings. Um, to make this possible. Generally, I, I know this is not, this slide is not going to, to work out well on a text, but those of, the, those of you in the class will find that on slide 42. Basically it looks, oh, look at that, it, it works. So you 
you fund it now, you find the money and borrow it from a from a credit card, a friend or whatever, so you can fund the full amount of the contribution that reduces your income. It may reduce your premium tax credit as well. And you end up with a much larger refund. And so you can pay back part of that money that you borrowed from the 401k to make this, to make this contribution possible for last year. So this is kind of a rough draft of how to do that when the client does not necessarily have all the cash right now, he can fund it, but get back half of the money. And then, okay. and you know, pay that back over five years if necessary, but he can get the big deduction and reduce other, increase other potential credits, reduce, uh, increase other attributes that he may be able to use for tax credits. Um, Sandra had a question. I understand if you're a sole prop or have a, P.S. I don't know, uh, or S corp. I guess a partnership or an S corp in which you are an employee as well. You can't be an employee in a in a partnership. It would be a good idea to now already open a solo four hundred one k before you finish your tax return, so you can decide on the short term. Yes, Sandra, that's why we're here. Once you get your draft return, whether and how much you want to contribute in case you owe taxes. And if you don't owe taxes, you can just keep the account for whenever needed. Well, it's not just about owing taxes. It's about building up savings. Ideally, if you don't owe taxes, you're going to put them into um, into accounts that will grow Roth like accounts that will grow tax free. And you'll be able to use the money when you retire without ever paying tax. Right. Yes, I would agree. Yeah, this. I mean, it, it's the tax deduction benefit is definitely a big driver, but but ultimately the money. The point is to save for retirement, right? So now you got money to save. Uh, the after-tax contributions, I mean, asks uh, through the payroll, like pre-tax, are run through payroll, or can after-tax contributions be depositly, deposited separately after the payroll has been run? See, there's no, uh, from a 401k perspective, there's no obligation to um, make the con any of the contributions through payroll. Of course, you wouldn't generally be making employer contributions through payroll, but the employee and the voluntary after tax are considered to be a type of employee contribution as well. So it, it would be acceptable to run through payroll, but it's certainly not required. I think the fact that the rules specifically allow the plan to be established, you know, meaning just sign the documents by the end of the year, but contributions don't have to be made until the business tax return deadline, including any timely filed extension, which could be nine or even 10 months later illustrates the point that it doesn't have to run through payroll well hang on if if i'm if i'm wanting to pick up the employee share of contributions if they are um on in a c corporation or even an s corporation i need to run that through payroll and what we're doing is we are showing the payroll with the reduced amount of net cash flow. We're booking the contribution and we are trying to, to send the money in um, within a week or so after payroll. So that's the part that comes out of the employee's check. The employer's check, we can do that anytime before the filing deadline. Now, what's if we file the tax return first and then make the contribution, but but take into account the computation as though we had made the contribution. Do we have to hold off filing the tax return until the contributions are made? Yes, that's my view. That's what I always thought. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I, I, it's good to know we agree. Anybody have any other questions? Because I know that you can you can visit his site and find a lot of things. Don't be lazy. Actually look at the information that they've gone to all of the trouble to put on the site and see if you can find an answer before you ask the question. Then if you can't, either post it to me or post it in, in George's community. And I guarantee you, you will get a useful answer. And if anyone needs to get anything set up, for yourself or for your clients, 
get in touch with him by morning. Get in touch with him by morning because for the September 15th deadline for partnerships and S corporations, as of tomorrow, you have three days left. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate all the awesome questions and opportunity. So if nobody has any other questions, I will thank George. I really appreciate your taking the time. You know, I've been teaching this for a long time, but there's so much I just learned today. Uh, and so, so very useful that what you've just told us. Uh, we are recording this and it will be available um, in the Tax Mama site, in the IRS exam site, and on Georgia's site on for a solo, my solo 401k. Yep, my solo 401k.net. So thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and uh, all the best. Would you like me to hang after a little bit, Ava?